Nigeria recently commemorated its 60th independence anniversary. Its citizens greeted the day with mixed feelings. Many, while grateful for a country they could call their own, were saddened by its poor development indices, in particular, endemic poverty and insecurity. Many attribute this state of affairs to bad governance, but feel constrained in hearing their views on this. The civic space in Nigeria has increasingly become repressed, and free speech has become increasingly difficult. How can you decree capital punishment for exercising, quote unquote, a God-given right, which is freedom of speech? We were not born in silence. We were born with the facility of speech. And speech is supposed to be the conveyance of the realities of life as we see, as we experience that life. The government has also sought to regulate civil society through draconian legislation with a very troubling narrative on the role of civil society in Nigeria. The decency we have in our, in our country, the decency we have in the society is basically because there are people who are fighting for our rights to be upheld. And when you, when you find a situation where most especially the business communities think to all about fraternizing with the political class and, and just getting their way in there, they forget that when the civil society is shut down, it means those in government are capable of doing whatever they want to do unchecked. Corrupt forces of destabilization funding terrorists. But are these charges true? Are they a misunderstanding or a deliberate attempt at tainting the public's perception of the only true opposition demanding accountability, rights, and dignity? From the first day that we returned to democratic rule, and the people who have been in the forefront of holding this line, civil society. They've been the ones who spoke up during the time of Obasanjo, the third term attempt, the unlawful and undemocratic removal of governors. They were in the forefront. In roughly 60 years preceding independence and the 60 years that have followed, Nigeria civic leaders and groups have been at the forefront of framing the nation and its development. At every turn in Nigeria's history, civil society has pointed directions for growth, democracy, education, health, and nationhood. In this span of time, organized civil society has displayed fervor and bravery in the face of systemic tyranny and state capture. Nigerians have refused to be docile, and each generation has had its moment of stepping to the plate and demanding for a Nigeria that works. The most recent step into the plate began merely a week after the nation's 60th independence anniversary. The country witnessed one of the best coordinated social movements in its history. Across Nigeria, thousands of citizens, in particular its young people, took to the streets to demand an end to the special anti-robbery squad, popularly known as SARS, which for years has been known for its brutalization and extrajudicial killings of many innocent Nigerians. If you gather five people in Nigeria, um, certainly in Lagos and probably in Nigeria today, you will find that at least three of them know somebody who has had some encounter with police brutality. It may not be SARS, but it's the, um, they will certainly be able to recount that to you. And I think, or, or extortion or whatever it is, the ways in which the police fall short of what they ought to be. There's something to be said about a citizenry that's young, a citizenry that's angry, a citizenry that's frustrated with not just the spate of killings, but the intentional disinformation, the intentional misinformation, but also the intentionality to sow seeds of discord across ethnic, religious and political lines. The protests defied conventional Euro-led movements and were led by everyone out on the streets as well as those behind the keyboards on social media. What digital media did was to open access to a wide range, over 30 million Nigerians for example, 
write editorial opinion on Facebook every day. They are on Twitter, they are on so many of these uh, platforms. So they are able to articulate their views, their vision, and they are able to fight their combats. The tipping point for the NSARS movement can largely be attributed to the growth in technology and digital advocacy in the past decade. Before NSARS, Nigeria had witnessed several other iconic movements that began with the digital space, including the Not Too Young to Run movement, the VAP Act, the Arawa Me Too. And these movements all gathered momentum online and led to measurable results on the ground. That hashtag prompted a lot of women in other Nigeria to come out and talk about their sexual abuse experiences. So that, that did a lot in breaking the culture of silence. These women were mentioning their abusers. In December 2015, uh, groups of Nigerians and also civil society groups did a march to the National Assembly uh, to demand that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the social media bill that then was uh, they wanted to implement was was uh, a stop was put to read, even though. Uh, five years later is still back uh, on the table but it helped because a lot of people didn't understand the implication a lot of people didn't understand what it meant and it took the civil society you know explaining to people creating that awareness and letting people understand uh, what, what, what was going on the Nigerian civic space has been a vibrant and inspiring force a fact that can be traced all the way back to pre-independence Nigeria Nigeria's civil society dates as far back as the pre-colonial times. While the region was yet to be known by geographical name Nigeria, it was made up of several kingdoms with monarchies that were subject to the will of its people. In these societies, there was always access to the public space to hear dissent and determine the trajectory for cooperation and growth. Then came the brutal invasion. From the south upward to the north, the British joined the mad rush to colonize the territory we now know as Nigeria. Iju Water Works in Lagos was the project of the was a pre-colonial project. Okay, in 1907, they decided to set up Iju Water Works and to levy. Now the water was going to be piped up for the white people who were running, ruling the place. Okay, but. The people who were going to pay for it were the locals who were going to be taxed. Now, the Eleko said, look, Eshibaya Eleko said, look, this is not what it should be done, what should be done. If you want water to pipe to be piped for you, you pay for it. Not asking my people to pay for it. That is exactly what led to the Lagos water riots. They instituted several draconian laws including the Public Order Ordinance, which forbade public gatherings and required police permits to be obtained for any gathering of more than five people. In spite of this, Nigerians still kept their dreams of an orderly society alive. Despite the regulation against public gatherings, Nigeria's civil society still organized several prolific movements during the pre-independence years. Many of these movements began as demands for better welfare for government employees. A foremost example was the Lagos strike of 1897, which was described as the first major protest of the colonial period in African history. The movement involved 3,000 workers in the public works department who were demanding better pay from the colonial government. The Aba Women's Revolt in 1929 was also monumental as it involved over 10,000 women who marched against the colonial government for seeking to impose a tax on women. The Abba Women's Revolt left at least 50 women dead and 50 others wounded. While many of these movements were responses to ash economic conditions, they ultimately became quest against the imposition of colonial and imperialist rule which resulted in Nigerian's independence in 1960.
The years following Nigeria's independence saw a rise in civic movements across the country. This was a great movement for trade unions as well as professional and business associations, such as bar associations and media groups. Through different forums, these groups demanded good governance and adequate public services, including health, education, jobs, and improved governance. Communities and regional associations also continue to feature greatly in the nation's civic space, supplementing governance. The work civil society groups have done in Nigeria in educating citizens to be active citizens, to be productive citizens, be it the things that have been done with, you know, grassroots, uh, cooperative training, skill acquisition and all of that, is something that we can take up and incorporate even in our traditional training models to help bring out young men and women who are self-sufficient, who don't need to look for employment. But government is not tapping into those resources as they should. The civic space had these active, progressive associations that were engaging against government to try to uh, develop a progressive agenda for the country. The so-called rising sun of Biafra is set forever. It will be a great disservice for anyone to continue to use the word Biafra to refer to any part of the east central state of Nigeria. The civil war ended as the 70s began. And as with other parts of the world, the Nigerian civil society became more formal and professional. For the first phase of what I will consider civic engagement in Nigeria, the people use progressive associations. Uh, first of all, there were the formal student associations, the student unions of different universities, as well as uh, the National uh, Union of Nigerian Students, which was subsequently banned by the military. Either two the most formal groups were labor unions, student unions, religious and community foundations. The Civil War was an avenue for new civic groups to join the Nigeria's civic space. And from then on, the country witnessed an increase in civil organizations. As a result of the growth in various civic-led movements, Nigerians enjoyed a brief intermission from military rule between 1979 and 1983. The new group of professional civil organizations targeted a variety of social issues. For example, the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, better known as the IITA, was working extensively with local farmers to increase crop production and reduce risks with the overarching goal of reducing hunger and malnutrition. Civil society in Nigeria responded to both challenges by forming organizations that took them head on. For example, the Nigerian Bar Association became more assertive in demanding for the government to respect the rule of law. And in 1984, it protested the suspension of due process and the systematic rule of military courts instead of civilian courts to prosecute. Activists and media organizations were mostly targeted. In one such instance, two editors with The Guardian newspaper, Tune Thompson and Unduka Irabo, were arrested and tried under a military tribunal for allegedly publishing false statements. In some cases, media houses were completely shut down and prevented from operating when they were perceived as being recalcitrant. It was in this context that the editor-in-chief of Newswatch, Delegiwa, was killed when a bomb delivered to his breakfast table by security agents exploded. Years after Delegiwa's assassination, the country would witness the execution of nine environmental activists led by Ken Sarawiwa after they organized a peaceful march against the environmental degradation of Ogoni land. In recovering the money 
that has been stolen from us. I do not want any blood spilt. Not of an Ogoni man, not of any strangers amongst us. We are going to demand our rights peacefully, non-violently, and we shall win. The struggle for democracy by various groups in Nigeria's civil space culminated in the 1993 general elections, where unofficial results indicated that the candidate of the Social Democratic Party, Chief Moshud Abiola, had won against his opponent from the National Republican Convention, Alaji Bashir Tofa. However, using his power as head of state, the then military president, General Ibrahim Babangida, annulled the election. It is true that the presidential election was generally seen to be free, fair, and peaceful. However, there was, in fact, a huge array of electoral practices virtually in all the states of the Federation before the actual voting began. In 1994, activists and political leaders formed the National Democratic Coalition, ADECO, to press for the revalidation of the June 12, 1993 presidential elections. And in July 1994, days after Abiola was arrested on charges of treason, Nupeng and Pangerson, unions of the petroleum industry, began the longest strike in Nigeria's history to protest the annulled presidential election. By the time the annulment took place, and the military, you know, they, and they were, they were helping us with logistics, with intelligence, with information. We were help, helping them with troops on the ground with reaching places that they could not reach and doing things that they could not do because they still needed to keep talking with the military and helping the military to leave, right? So by the time the annulment took place and we decided we were going to go to the streets, the politicians were happy because it helped them in their insider negotiations. They were not telling us, of course, that they were having those the extent of the commitments they were making uh, in the insider negotiations, but we were all talking. That is the point of so i don't think it's probably balanced to say the um the um uh what the the civil society made it happen i think it was an alliance across national alliance of all manner of interests across the country The return of a democratic system was a hard-fought battle that Nigerian civil society has been instrumental in winning. The victory ushered in a new era in the civic space where Nigerians could freely organize and advocate on policy issues. Corruption was one of the first issues to receive civil society's attention after the new elected democratic government was sworn in. The government worked to establish agencies to investigate corruption and fraudulent activities, while Nigeria civil society organized outreaches to educate the Nigerian public on the importance of these agencies. Given the nation's long history of poor leadership, Nigeria civil society organization has also heavily invested in promoting good governance since 1999. Various organizations are working to strengthen democratic governance as well as citizens' participation in governance across the country. A recent example of this is the campaign led by Yaga Africa, which sought to increase the participation of young Nigerians in politics and governance by amending the age criteria required to contest elections. The Not Too Young to Run bill was signed into law in 2018 by the president, marking an important victory not just for young people in civil society, for the entire Nigerian population. While it might seem like civil society in Nigeria has been preoccupied with the technicalities of development and ensuring a stronger democracy, the Nigerian government, and indeed the world, was reminded in 2012 that there resides within Nigeria's civil society space a tremendous ability to rally around pertinent issues. This reminder came as a concerted effort 
against President Goodluck Jonathan's administration after it announced plans to remove fuel subsidy. The movement against fuel subsidy or the corruption in the fuel sector or Occupy Nigeria, as it was called, was one of the largest civic movements Nigeria had witnessed since the emergence of the Fourth Republic. Nigeria civil society is living through its most precarious times, but having survived years of military rulership while remaining active through it all, there's much to be said about its strength and resilience. There is no doubt that Nigeria's civic space will continue to require support both internally and from international community as it continues to tackle its multifaceted responsibilities while still grappling with a civilian government that continues to act like a military government. I'm, I'm, I must put on record that the attempt to stifle civil society groups in Nigeria is deliberate. It's not an accident. It is a progressive, there's an, a progressive attempt by government to make the environment under which CSOs function to be difficult. That's the reality. They've done it with their bills, they've done it with their regulations, but the worst kind of the service government has done to this country is the attempt to discredit CSOs, to look at them as people that are against government, to look at them as people that collect money from us out of the country and are not accountable for it, to look at them as people who want to destabilize the country. I think that's the biggest disservice and that's the biggest dishonesty on the part of government because they know better. To say they truly have a democracy means our people must be able to organize themselves, dissent if they will, approve if they will, but our people must have a voice in governance and that is what participatory governance is. Once you control civil society, we no longer have participatory governance. Every individual must make up his or her mind. There can be no uh, second guessing, double standards. You cannot say it's all right. The boot which is placed on your, placed on your neck, you can not say that. Oh, as long as it's worn by a black man, it's all right. Or a black woman, it's all right. That it's only wrong when that boot on the back of your neck is worn by an external person. No, no, no. You just don't want a boot on your neck. Otherwise, you're subhuman. And that is what I would like civil uh, movements always to be conscious of. With so much resting on the shoulders of civil society in Nigeria, it would be totally egregious to take away its liberties and indeed a huge step back to where it has fought so hard and so long to advance from. Mm-hmm.